Hi, uh, my name is Diego Ramirez Lovering, and I'm here as the chair of the uh, Faculty and Mamas Climate Action Task Force. And I'm really delighted to say a few words uh, in advance of uh, Brian Martin and Brooke Andrews' uh, conversation as the inaugural event of the uh, uh, Climate Action Task Force um, uh, events. Uh, it's also uh, presented by the Women Jekar Jimbana Research Lab. And I'd uh, uh, like to thank the lab and also Hannah Matthews from MAMA and Catherine Murphy from the Department of Architecture for orchestrating this. So the Climate Action Task Force was formed uh, at the start of last year after the Black Summer bushfires. And um, since then, we have been busy establishing an action plan which commits MADA uh, and MAMA to climate change, climate action. Um, we are uh, committed to making a fundamental and critical contribution to an ethical, healthy, biodiverse, and fair future for life on our planet. We believe that climate-aware design and delivery will contribute to improved planetary health, and we strive to excel in this area. So we seek to frame our actions as informed by indigenous ways of, know of knowing and by the UN Sustainable Development Goals, and to transform our ways of working through a paradigm shift in our emphasis of knowledge and actions. This will involve building new understandings, new partnerships, new practices, new structures within MARA and MAMA and others. So these new understandings, these new practices can learn so much from indigenous ways of knowing. Uh, and here I paraphrase uh, Brian, uh, who uses the, the term, the word uh, relationality, um, uh, is, is a notion where we are so fundamentally connected to a uh, country and to each other, where we respect country, we do not hurt country, uh, when we are, of course, connected to country. Um, I found some words by Dr. Uh, Dennis Foley, uh, Guy Marigal, and Wurjury Man, um, who's also a Fulbright scholar, um, that really resonated. And he says, the land is the mother, and we are of the land. We do not own the land, rather the land owns us. The land is our food, our culture, our spirit, and our identity. So these tenets are fundamental to climate action and to our work, uh, uh, the work of the task force. Um, and we really look forward to learning more about these notions through today's conversation um, and uh, through future events. So thank you very much. Hello, Brooke. Hey there, Brian. How are you? So um, I'll, I'll start off this, uh, this uh, talk and yarn we're going to have today with, of course, acknowledging our country, which is really important for Indigenous peoples and also for myself and also for you, as we have done many times. So Nagala Na Yungan, Nagala Gara Mala Yungan, Wanajala Mala Kurugala Yungan, Nagala Mala Mala Yungan, Nagala Ma Mala Yungan. Again, Nyama being Bunwarong, Warandri, Waterong, Kulan Yungan, and Nagala Gali Banjo. And I said, we belong to country, we look after country, we don't do wrong around country, we don't harm country, we belong to country. And also pay my respects and pay our respects really to. Uh, Wurundjeri, Bunwurrung country, Wadawurrung country, where I'm located at the moment, and also to Kulin country and extend that respects to Bunjil, being the great creator, ancestor of the Kulin nations. So, um, uh, Brooke, Garo, Andrew and myself, Brian Martin, we're going to talk about trees, we're going to talk about country, and we're going to talk about our collective practices and a project that we're both working on with the Australian Research Council. Um, I'm just gonna start off and talking about a little bit about, I suppose, my drawing practice and going into the tree story exhibition that's on at MAMA, Monash University Museum of, of Art uh, at the moment. Uh, and then um, 
Brooke's going to talk about his practice as well and how we both really look about look at country, look at trees in particular, and um, and how we're both working on a specific project, the significance of Gulani, which is a Wiradjuri word for trees, and Aboriginal knowledge systems. So I'm going to share my screen here to show one thing that sort of influenced, well, not influenced, but also drives uh, my connection to country, my connection to um, trees, my connection to practice is this idea that uh, a non-Indigenous writer come, come up with this idea of ideational drawing and drawing being thinking and thought as a verb. Like when we think about the word draw, like, you know, you draw something out, a, draw, a set of drawers, like they're, they're active words. And when we think about relationality and language in, in Indigenous cultures around Australia, our words to describe our relationship to the world are usually premised on verbs. So, for example, in the many languages around Aboriginal Australia, we don't have words to describe what we'll translate as art. For example, we're a Gaia uh, language at, uh, of the Wajabalak in the sort of northwest of Victoria around Horsham. Yaka means to paint, so they're active words. In Yagamba or Bunjalung, we have words like Gajul or Jarang, which translate as the arm, how it joins the torso, or how the leg, the thigh joins the torso and the hip area, or how a tree uh, branch joins the main trunk, same as how a wing of a bird joins its body. So the words are interchangeable between the relationship between entities, between humans and the non-human. And one of those non-human things is country and is trees. And this is what's important when we think about language in general in Indigenous languages, like the word Vajali. Vajali in Vajalang means uh, to rain, but not just to rain. Vajji means to strike, and it's where rain is striking the earth. So it, it's, it's, uh, it's visceral, it's order, order, audible. Um, it's not as, uh, only oral, but it's also got a tacit type um, aspect to um, when we think about languages. And that goes for the word country. So one thing that drives um, practice is our relationship and, re and relationality to country. And in the various Aboriginal languages in use today around Australia, we don't really have words that translate as land. We have words that translate as country. And country is a living subject you know it's our relationship with the world that's really important it's our relationship to each other it's our relationship to place and these are very fundamental things to indigenous culture but also to indigenous practice and creative practice so i'm going to talk about this in terms of drawing and i'm going to show a couple of examples of drawings and this particular example here um, is of barkindji country which is in uh, nor, uh, what, how far west New South Wales, so out near Broken Hill, Canyon, Menindi area, so Barkindji, Wulakali, Yimpa country. And these drawings are an articulation of country. They're done in 30 pieces, drawn in 30 pieces. And I'm going to go through how I construct the drawing. So if we look at the bottom right hand corner, um, that shows you how abstract the pieces are. And these drawings are made up of 30 pieces. Um, and each piece is just, uh, it's important to look at the, uh, the tactile knowledge that we find in mark making in relation to country and how that is articulated through practice, through um, abstraction, through to this premise of representation. And I'll talk about this as I just go through this drawing. So that makes the bottom right hand corner and then the drawing builds itself um, over the execution of it. I wish I could draw this fast, but I don't. Um, be pretty deadly, eh? So, um, so the drawing is constructed this way. And what really interests me is my interest when we look at practice and look at country. I always thought about the works of, of course, celebrated artist Albert Namajira. And, and over the years, I, I then looked at the work of Tommy McRae and, of course, um, a very important Rundry. Um, Narangida elder and leader, um, William Barrack. And in Tommy McRae and William Barrack's work, 
they're very interesting because you see for the first time really in Indigenous creative practice the introduction of the horizon line and the, the introduction of this notion of gravity and, and different types of pictorial space and as understood in a Western way. What's really important about that is when we think about the imaginary world, which I call the Western world, the horizon line is an imaginary. You can never reach the horizon. It doesn't exist. That is very opposed to the real conditions of existence that, that are in Indigenous cultural practices. Country, what's under our feet, what's around us is real. The horizon line is something that is imaginary in a way we cannot obtain or attain the horizon. And that's what's really interesting when we look at Western historical landscape painting, um, it's, it becomes this imaginary, it becomes a representation. So for me, that's what's really important about this idea, representation and abstraction and the real world and the imaginary world. The current work that's in uh, the museum, MAMA, Museum uh, Monash University Museum of Art, uh, one work which is a Gamilaroi drawing on the wall is a way, a type of representation. However, the work on the floor, which is the first drawing I've done uh, on Boongwurrung country. So I went around with um, Ani Caroline Briggs, now we Dr. Caroline Briggs AM, and we walked around Boongwurrung country in search for different trees. And this tree on the, on the ground, this gentleman is standing on, the whole idea of this idea, um, notion of walking on the work, walking on the drawing, is you're walking on Boongwurrung country. And what's really important about this is your experience, the whole idea is to have the experience of being immersed within country, immersed within the work. And there's a different relationship that we have with practice by standing on it. I call this photograph Bunwurong on Bunwurong on Bunwurong. It's like quadruple, triple Bunwurong. So we have senior Bunwurong, held Arnie, Caroline, standing on Bunwurong drawing, actually on Bunwurong country. And what's, for me, what's significant about this is our relationship, immersive relationship to the drawing um, and our embodiment and, and relationality to it is deeply connected. When we put something on the wall, it becomes representation. It becomes that imaginary. We still have this relationship with the agency of practice and knowing and over things, but there's like this space between and the work, whereas when you can experience and actually walk on the on something quite different. And it's interesting because when we look at a lot of Indigenous visual practices around Australia, uh, has been described as, <clears throat> as mapping, but also looking at the positional perspective of um, looking down from an end to country and how country mapped that way. So it's almost like looking at that as well. So that's what's really important is relationship to country. One thing that's also very important and also the tree school, which is um, part of tree story, is we had the opportunity, significant opportunity to um, uh, become custodians of this beautiful marked tree. And this sort of leads into um, some of the work that um, Brooke and I are into in terms of the Australian Research Council grant and funding that we're exploring the significance of Gulani trees. And in this particular case, this is what's known as a scar tree. And also taking um, and reconfiguring how we describe things and use language. So. I'm going to refer to this as a marked tree instead of a scar, because a, a scar sort of has negative connotations to it as well. So um, this marked tree, as we can see with these two spaces, the, the, the bottom space or the top of the picture um, would have been a shield that was um, taken out of the bark. And also the top one possibly would have been a coolerman. What's significant about this, this tree and talking to Arnie Caroline and also David Tornia, another Bunurong knowledge holder, is it's highly likely that this tree was marked in a pre-colonial period. 
Um, and you can see that the size of the shield would have been where the marking curves in. So the top of the curve actually um, represents where the, the actual shield um, would have been situated. And this is quite significant because I, we're, we're so honored at Monash University and at MARA, Monash Art Design and Architecture to be custodians of this for a period of time. We're trying to work out what we can do with, with the tree as well. And we can take 3D scans of the tree, reproduce different types of things from it. It's an exciting project. Um, but this is really, I suppose, this shows, oh, it's a great way to start, I suppose, the project with Brooke. Um, the significance of oh, um, the, the importance of trees, the significance of Kulani. Um, and it's our way, I suppose, our way entry point through the research, through practice. And there's something that I know that, Brooke, you've done in your practice. You've looked at scanning trees, um, significant trees that are collected, that have been held in other museums. I'm, I might stop my sharing my screen here so we can talk a bit. Um, and I suppose that's where I might hand over to you, Brooke, to introduce yourself and talk about what you're doing. It's quite an amazing thing to go from an amazing ancestor almost, isn't it? Like, and when you have, if you are on the campus, uh, uh, we encourage you to go look at this tree, which is in building G, because it has a presence. Um, so speaking of presence, I'll hand it to you, my brother, to, to introduce yourself and talk about what you've been doing. Yeah, my Brian. Um, nga jingi nga ndaraga, nga ju Wiradjuri from the Kalamide, which is the land of the three rivers. And I'd also like to acknowledge um, the lands of the Wurundjeri and the Bunurong and the Kulin Nation. And to you, um, brother, and everyone else joining today, uh, there are so many parts of acknowledgement and how we live our life that is important for us and ceremony, but also the absence of things that have power has been something that I think uh, has inspired both of us to really focus on trees and, and, and both of us as artists, uh, let alone us being, uh, you know, going on this journey now has been living with us for a long time. So it's really quite extraordinary uh, to, to do this. And of course, the ARC is more than a galania, so more than a tree, and it is more than a tree. And so thank you for, um, for that uh, introduction for everybody. I might just share my screen now, and here we go. I would like to just start with this image here. Um, this is a very early... Uh, Charles Kerry photograph. It's quite shocking. This is from the Powerhouse Museum. And uh, I mean, apart from the environmental impact, uh, you know, people might have seen quite large trees, four, 500 year old trees in rainforest areas with the diameters of eight to 10 to 12 meters being chopped down. And I think it's of the past, but this sort of devastation actually continues today right across Australia. And for Indigenous people getting access to those trees um, or those spaces that are often still on private land is often still negotiated uh, with private la um, landholders. And it's really fantastic that, you know, you and Andy Carolyn um, and others could secure the tree. I mean, people really should look at the, the, the tree, the Galani there on campus with great pride and, and great uh, privilege, I think. Uh, I might just share a little bit. I've had this uh, uh, relationship with this tree at the Pitt Rivers Museum in Oxford for many, many uh, years, I would say over a, a decade or so. It's one of three trees that I know of or sections or dendroglyph of Galeni, um, dendroglyph, sorry, of Galeni that I know are overseas. One here at the Pitt Rivers, two in the Ethnographic Museum in Geneva. Um, it's important because we're thinking that in 1867, this tree was actually exhibited in the, in the 1867 Paris Great Exhibition and was purchased by Pitt Rivers. I was working, or well, I do work with Christopher Morton, who's uh, one of the lead researchers at the Pitt Rivers Museum. It's important to say that the, the, the carvings on these trees 
uh, either used for bore or men ceremony or to mark people of high degree. And often there's a lot of distress in our communities because when these trees are taken away and when they're returned or if people visit them, uh, some people find it very confusing about the, the meanings and, and how we interact with, with some of these out of great respect, of course. This here is a, a 3D scan and it's really great. Brian, thank you for uh, talking a little bit about the uh, future prospects of the, of the Galani on site. I think that these are important things for our communities and as artists to explore and as scholars and connectors to kind of explore what does it mean about the copy, especially when we're talking about uh, these kind of really loaded histories and the trees and what they actually mean for us. This was, uh, I see this as a position as a powerful object, not as an artwork, but this was at the at Niren, at uh, the Biennale, 22nd Biennale of Sydney that I was the artistic director of. And I, I place this next to um, other people's artworks and, and certain people responded to them along with, the, you can see the uh, painting on the wall in the background, that's of Eric Bridgman, a Papua New Guinean Australian artist who also reflected on uh, what is the meaning of, for example, if this happened to have been a burial tree? And there was also Frederick McCubbin's uh, a bush burial painting that we borrowed from Geelong Art Gallery, which was hanging next to it. This is really just a quick snapshot of some of my wall drawings that have been very much inspired by a continuation of our culture of, of markings. And here is just a larger uh, kind of photo um, representing, yeah, that kind of installation at the Museum of Contemporary Art. It had Stone Maka, which is uh, the artist who has that incredible uh, work on the floor, the big tapa cloth, and of course, the McCubbin and uh, Eric Bridgman's work. That's also his wall painting. On the, the left here is a, a a film, or it's a documentation really, it's called the Balfour footage, uh, taken in 1949, actually documented uh, anthropologists and museum, uh, I suppose, employees from uh, the South Australian Museum. And also, I'm pretty sure it was uh, Museum Victoria who went on a pilgrimage and removed many hundreds of trees or Galani that were carved of great importance to gain permission to show this footage. I mean, this is uh, not showing the great circular saws that were cutting down these trees. If you could imagine that these uh, gravestones or they are, you know, special places of, of ceremony. So imagine uh, churches or mosques or other kind of uh, places of uh, ceremony uh, being destroyed. As you can imagine, going back to community now and talking about that and reliving that and asking permission to show that destruction was a very important aspect of showing this in that context. We were really grateful to uh, many people at um, Collianenbrae who brought together the children uh, and also, you know, from the schools and there was a smoking ceremony outside of uh, some existing trees which are protected. Um, the kind of uh, complex history of the protection of these trees still exists for our communities. Uh, two trees were stolen, even though it's in, within a cage. Uh, you can see that on the left-hand side here, there are two uh, support beams on concrete bases where somebody had smashed their four-wheel drive or something into that and stolen two of those uh, those carved trees. So still today, that kind of um, vandalism continues, as it does, of course, with other cultural heritage like rock art, and even right up until uh, you know up Rio Tinto, you know, destroying quite ancient, um, important cultural sites. Uh, yeah, so I think that the the way in which I think Brian that we're we're looking at, you know, it's more than a galani, more than a tree. Is, is quite inspiring. And I think that it's probably the first time maybe that the ARC or, uh, you know, kind of the wider uh, scholar community has really looked at such important objects that are often just kind of relegated to, you know, the anthropology museum space. Mm. Uh, absolutely, Brooke, and I think that's a, 
when you're talking, I think I think what you just said then is a really good sort of lead way into a, a funding body like the uh, ARC. I think you're correct. Is the first time there. Look, looking at country not from a scientific or anthropological positioning, but we're we're looking at it from a practice, cultural practice positioning, which is quite unique for the ARC, not for us. That is, but. One thing that you said, and I think this leads significantly in there, when we think about the agency of the non-human, so think about the mm. devastation of trees, but also like the Rio de Patinto, the, like the recent destruction of the Japarong tree. And it's interesting because what draws me to that particular work that you, the image you showed of the, the, the tree, which is significant to Wiradjuri and Bora, Aura sites and also the scan that you've done and also to things like the Jabberong tree is there's this things historically have tended to be human centered so for example the argument around the Jabberong tree is because there's no human there was no evidence of human interaction therefore it has does it have cultural heritage is an interesting question and that's what's interesting when we think about the scan that you've done is what cultural agency does that have in comparison to this idea of the, origin, the original um, tree? And these are really important questions because we're questioning the role of the human in the non-human world. And I think an Indigenous perspective on the world was non-human. You know, human agency, agency was premised on place, was premised on the non-human. I think yeah. these are really important questions, especially you started off with that image in the beginning, really looking at sustainability. When we think about climate change, destruction of the environment, these are all things that are really important to the survival of humanity. The non-human is very important. Absolutely. And that custodianship, I mean, we just have to look at the Wanganui River in, um, in Aotearoa, where a Maori community was finally, uh, you know, given uh, title from the, um, from the New Zealand government to actually name that river as, a, as an actual identity and a place. And it just shows that strong custodianship and that link as you're talking about. And I think that if that law or existed within an Australian context, the relationship to uh, the birthing trees that you're talking about and many other sites would flip and absolutely uh, um, be complete opposites. And I think that that would actually usher in a, a whole lot of respect as well for culture. And I think that uh, this is a very uh, interesting dilemma that as Indigenous people we constantly find ourselves in because without that acknowledgement we're firmly still placed within the kind of primitivist kind of anthropological uncivilized not developed uh, you know this kind of hierarchy of, of importance within culture uh, I mean people's houses that they build yesterday are insured and they're mm. Um, looked after and the, I mean the kind of the, 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 the kind of uh, dilemmas around that uh, uh, are quite confounding. Mm. Yeah, yeah ab absolutely and I think I think you hit the nail on the head just then in terms of we've got an opportunity which is really exciting not only working together that's mm. very exciting but also it's about reascribing value I think is a really important thing and you're absolutely right because we are in, a, in, in contemporary society, we are in this constant flux and constant dilemma, you know, COVID, you know, climate, where there's sustainable living, what's our footprint on the earth? And I think it is that transition between when we think of, think of the, the, the Western trajectory, especially in institutions like universities and, and so on, that, it was all premise on this scientific discovery where the human being was this objective being in space and time that did not have affect on the world because the human being, the male white human being was the all purveyor of truth and mm. knowledge. So the scientific experiment was about 
you should not have too much impact on, on the experiment because you can influence the truth. I call it the God complex in a way, whereas an indigenous view of the world is, of course, we have impact on the earth. We leave footprints in the sand. So we are not objective beings. We have relationality with everything around us. And I think that's when what's important in today's society when we think about being, being in isolation, for example, um, in lockdown proves that we have to stop our relationality for, you know, for us to get over this pandemic in a way. So uh, we're in very interesting times. And I think we hear that term, you know, the future is Indigenous. I sincerely and fundamentally believe that because we have to look back to the, to, to the local conditions of existence and how people have survived and had resistance for, for thousands and thousands of years by looking at local knowledge. And I think that's what's significant when we stand in front of, you know, the Mark Tree, which is at, on Monash campus at the moment, it, it contains knowledge, it contains agency, you know, mm. and I think that's what's really important. We have a lot to learn from the non-human. We have a lot to learn from our own historic culture. We have, you know, and how our culture adapts and survives and amalgamates different technologies always has reflected the real conditions of, of that type of existence at that particular time. So we're not a static culture. Mm. Mm. That's what's exciting as well, the old and the new together. Yeah. And I think that with that comes great responsibility and great care. I think that non-Indigenous people might have some sense of that when they're caring or tending for their own garden, for example, or their indoor plants, or, you know, like to visit certain places, some people more than others. But I call it slow culture. You know, I think that Indigenous culture, it's kind of like slow food, slow cooking, slow life. You know, there's a longevity to it. There's a responsibility to it. It's not immediate. Um, it's not expedient. Uh, and I say this without any romance as well. And I often think about the Blacktown Native Institute and the Darug mob up there and how the local Blacktown Council uh, gave that land back to them and they've turned that into a caring site and uh, a healing site to restitute the place back to, you know, uh, a space of, of its own being. And they call that uh, Blacktown Native Institute site her. So, you know, that is an absolute being. And, uh, and Brian, I'm really excited about the uh, PhD students who will be joining us. And um, I'm just wondering, this would be a great opportunity maybe to talk about them. No, exactly. I mean, we can't talk about exactly who they are Too just much, yet. <laughs> within the ARC, it's really yeah, yeah. great. Indigenous methodologies yeah. and, yeah. yeah. Oh, look, it's, it's amazing. It just means um, we're, we're going to have um, two PhDs uh, working with us on this project, also bringing their, their phenomenal experience, not only as practitioners, but as also Indigenous peoples as well. So it's a... We're, we're a small team and also working with Dr. Jessica Neef, who's, a, you know, who you know, amazing oh, as well. So we're a team of five, really, you know, um, working on this, which is absolutely um, on, on the project, which is absolutely significant. I mean, the, the great thing about this is we're building Indigenous people's uh, capacities well within the system. We're building critical mass by... Um, you know, having scholarships for PhDs as well. So I think that's a great thing about the project is it's not only about the, building that cultural knowledge and also the practice knowledge and the outputs in that way, but it's also the benefit to community, it's the benefit to the non-Indigenous community, and it's also the benefit of building um, individual people's capacity within mm -hmm. this environment and building critical mass in the academy and building mm -hmm. that knowledge as well. Yeah. And, and many people who are watching this and will you know, go and see the exhibition at, uh, at MAMA as well probably don't understand that there is an Indigenous lab at MARTA. Yes, that's absolutely. So we do at, at MARTA, so Monash University Art, Design and Architecture, we have an Indigenous research lab called Woman Jekka Jimbana, which is located on the Caulfield campus. And Brooke and I are, of course, members of that lab. We have a, we've got about now about 15, 15 people, 14 to 15 people as staff and candidates. We started out what, two years ago with I think three or four of us. Now now we've grown to about 
14, 15. And really, Woolman, Jacka, Jimbana were the words which were um, negotiated and worked out with um, Arnie Caroline Briggs, Dr. Caroline Briggs, uh, means welcome, but welcome with purpose and obligation. Uh, and with that obligation is ethical and cultural obligation to country and to people. And Jimbana means a place to share, exchange, knowledge uh, and practices. So it's, um, that's the, the vision of Woman Jack and Jimbana Research Lab is the synergies between Indigenous ways of knowing, knowing and practice-led research. So we've been building a lot of projects over the last couple of years and it's all coming to fruition. And um, we're becoming a substantial presence in the university, which is, which is fantastic, which is really good. And it's true to say too that, it, I mean, the incredible work and dedication you've been doing, Brian, has like over the last few years built such an incredible international representation of Indigenous and other connected PhD students, but also uh, workshops, I mean, presence within, within that, and of course, uh, Jacinta as well. Yeah, I mean, it, it's sort of, very, it's like the stars have aligned. It's like, it's quite amazing because you've got um, not only the lab, but also, you know, Monash University, of course, has appointed the Pro Vice Chancellor Indigenous a couple of years ago, who's Professor Jacinta Elston. And it's, I think all these things have come together uh, quite beautifully because it is about having that footprint, not just in Australia, but also in the international space, especially in places like Canada, Turtle Island, where they're leading that decolonial agenda and trajectory as well. But I think the great thing as Indigenous practitioners and thinkers and knowledge holders is we bring to the lab all these different connections, like your connections globally are quite phenomenal. So it's, bring, it's how we're getting more interest coming into the lab for people thinking, oh, look, I'd like to do a PhD now because you're there and we've got it's a safe space, it's a cultural space, you know. That's a huge shift in the academy. And I think, um, it's, I mean, I'm proud to work with everyone. It's, it's fantastic. I think we're doing some amazing stuff. Yeah, yeah. And, of course, there'll be updates too. I mean, we'll be giving some presentations about more than a Galani, and, and I think it's a great way for the students and staff to kind of get involved in these Indigenous methodologies that are often hidden from public view and from that kind of do dominant narrative. And I think there are really great ways for people to engage and learn from the work that happens at the lab. I, absolutely. And I think the great thing about more than a Galani project is it, it, it's not just it's not just a research project. It, it, it uh, comes to fruition. It materializes in practice, like Tree Story. It, it has these outputs or um, symposia, or have the interface where people can connect and come in um, and learn from the research that's being done as well. So it has pedagogical aspect as well across. I'm not only at the university, but also in the public sphere. And that's what's really important, like projects um, like this, and particularly how it has synergies with um, something like the Woman Jacka Jim Baylor Research Lab. Mm. Mm. Well, that's great, so, right? So, so I think that might do us, really. I think we're done. So, Absolutely. And uh, yeah, I'd like to thank everyone for you know uh, watching this, and um, I really encourage you to come along and say hello to us at the lab and uh, look out for any updates. Yep, definitely. Thank, thank you, thank you, Brooke. And then go, thanks. Thank you.